Welcome to lesson 4D, the strain rate tensor. In this lesson, we'll define the linear strain rate, the volumetric strain rate, and the shear strain rate. Then we'll show how to combine this and this into the strain rate tensor. Of course, we'll do some example problems along the way. Linear strain rate. We know from our study of solid mechanics that linear strain is the increase in length per unit length. Linear strain comes about due to normal stresses acting on an element. In our case, it's a fluid element or a fluid particle. If this is our initial fluid particle and there are normal stresses acting to stretch in the horizontal direction and compress in the vertical direction, the fluid particle will distort, such as I sketched here. Mathematically, consider a segment of fluid of length dx. Call this location 0 and this location dx. Suppose speed u acts at point 0, and using a truncated Taylor series as we've done before, the horizontal speed at dx is u plus del u del x dx. This is at some time t. At some later time, the fluid segment has moved and stretched. This is at t plus dt. What is the new location of initial point 0? Well, it's the initial distance 0 plus the speed times dt to first order. What about initial point dx? Its new location is its old location, dx, plus its speed, u plus del u del x dx, times dt. Linear strain is the increase in length per unit length. So we take this length minus this length divided by this length. So linear strain is this distance dx plus u dt plus del u del x dx dt. That's this location. We subtract this location minus u dt. This combination of terms is the new length. Now we subtract the old length, which is simply dx. That's the original length. We divide again by the original length dx. These two terms cancel, these two terms cancel, and the dx's cancel, so the linear strain becomes del u del x dt. Remember that in fluids, we are interested in the rate of linear strain, which is d dt of the linear strain, which we approximate as 1 over dt del u del x dt. Again, the dt's cancel, and thus, the linear strain in the x direction is just del u del x. We use the notation epsilon xx for the linear strain in the x direction. Similarly, epsilon yy is del v del y, and epsilon zz is del w del z. These are the linear strain rates in Cartesian coordinates. Let's do a quick example. Suppose we have this steady 2D velocity field. Let's calculate the three linear strain rates. Epsilon xx is del u del x, which is just 2y. Epsilon yy is del v del y, which is negative 2y. And since w is 0, epsilon zz is 0. So these are our answers. Now let's talk about shear strain rate. Shear strain is defined as half of the decrease of the angle between two initially perpendicular lines that intersect at a point. If this is our initial fluid element, and now we have shear stresses acting on the faces of this element, it will distort. By this definition, we have two initially perpendicular lines that intersect here, and after the distortion, those two initially perpendicular lines are no longer perpendicular. We can do a Taylor series analysis and figure out what half of the decrease of the angle is. I'm not going to do that here. You can see the textbook for details. Again, we're interested in the rate the rate of shear strain, or the shear strain rate, can be derived. It turns out that there are six components. We use notation epsilon xy, where the xy indicates that we're talking about two initially perpendicular lines along the x and y axes, as in our sketch. It turns out that epsilon xy is one-half del u del y plus del v del x. Epsilon yx is one-half del v del x plus del u del y, but by the commutative property of addition, these are the same. Similarly, epsilon zx is one-half del w del x plus del u del z, and epsilon xz is the same. These two are equal. This notation means that the two initially perpendicular lines are in the x and z axes directions. And finally, we do the same in the z and y directions. And these two are equal. So we see we have six components of shear strain rate, but only three independent ones, since these pairs are equal to each other. Let's do an example. Taking the same velocity field as before, let's calculate these six shear strain rates, or three independent ones. Del u del y is 2x. Del v del x is 0, since there's no x in the v term. So our first answer is epsilon xy equal epsilon yx equal x. Since w is 0, these two terms go away, and since neither u nor v are functions of z, these derivatives go away. So the other four components are all 0. 
we conclude that there is shear strain in the xy plane only in this particular problem. Now we combine linear and shear strain rates into what we call the strain rate tensor. You may have to brush up on your math to recall the properties of a tensor. Strain rate tensor is second order, which means it has nine components, and we write it as a three by three matrix. Just briefly, a scalar has magnitude only, a vector has magnitude plus direction, and a second order tensor is one level of difficulty above this. It has magnitude and direction, but these depend on the surface orientation. So we may have some stress on this surface when the element is oriented like that, but when the element is oriented in some other direction, the stress on that surface will be different both in magnitude and direction. There's also the issue of notation. Some authors like to put two arrows over their variable to indicate a tensor, since it's kind of an extension of a vector. By the way, a scalar is a zeroth order tensor, while a vector is a first order tensor. We're talking about a second order tensor. You can also have third, fourth, and larger tensors. So you can write epsilon double arrow, or some authors use a very bold font to indicate a tensor, or we use what's called tensor notation and write epsilon ij with components epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 1, 2, epsilon 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3, and 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. You can think of 1 implying the x-axis, 2y, and 3z, so this can be written as epsilon xx, epsilon xy, epsilon xz, etc. We've already defined epsilon xx, yy, and zz. These are the linear strain rates, and we define the shear strain rates by these off-diagonal components. Epsilon ij will be important later when we derive the differential equations of fluid motion, where we relate the strain rate tensor to the stress tensor. I typed out the equation here for convenience. Using the components we derived previously, we have the normal strain rates on the diagonals and the shear strain rates on the off-diagonals. This tensor is symmetric, recalling that these two are equal, these two are equal, and these two are equal. So there are nine components in the tensor, but only six of them are independent. Let's do an example problem. We had a previous example with this simple velocity field, 3xi minus 3yj, and it's two-dimensional, so w equals zero. Let's calculate the rate of translation, rate of rotation, the three linear strain rates, the six shear strain rates, and the strain rate tensor. We did parts A and B in a previous lesson. Recall the rate of translation is simply the velocity vector, so our answer is here. The rate of rotation we had written out as this in Cartesian coordinates. For this velocity field, omega turned out to be zero, and therefore vorticity is also zero. This flow is irrotational. Now let's calculate the three components of linear strain rate. Here u equal 3x and v equal minus 3y. So epsilon xx is del u del x, which is just 3. I should mention that in these kinds of problems, I'm not concerned about units. We assume that these constants have units that agree with the equations to make them dimensionally consistent. Similarly, epsilon yy is del v del y, which is negative 3. And epsilon zz is 0, since this is two-dimensional. So these are the three components of linear strain rate. As a side note, notice that epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz equals zero. When the sum of the linear strain rates equals zero, the flow is incompressible. This is the case here since three minus three plus zero is zero. Now let's look at the components of shear strain rate. There are six of them, but only three are independent. Epsilon xy is one half del u del y, which is zero, plus del v del x, which is zero, remembering that u equal three x and y equal minus three y. Epsilon zx and epsilon xz are also zeros, but this is because it's 2D. Same for epsilon yz and epsilon zy. So in this flow, there is no shear strain. All six components of the shear strain rate are zero. What does this mean physically? If this is one of our streamlines, and we have this square fluid particle at some time here at this location, as it moves along the streamline, it stretches in the x direction, since the linear strain rate in that direction is positive, and it shrinks in the y direction, since epsilon yy is negative, and nothing changes in the third direction into the page. So the particle distorts, but it does not shear. These initially perpendicular angles remain perpendicular. Furthermore, since the sum of the linear strain rates is zero, this flow is incompressible, meaning that this area has to equal this area. 
as the particle moves and distorts. Notice that there is also no net rotation, so this flow is irrotational as had been pointed out previously. The final part of this example problem is to calculate the strain rate tensor. We plug in all our components from above and we get this. Here the xy axes are principal axes since we have non-zero diagonal components but all the off diagonal components are zero. If we were to rotate the axes these components would all change and our rotated axes would no longer be principal axes. This is the nature of tensors. Finally, let's talk about something called volumetric strain rate. Volumetric strain is the change of volume of a fluid particle per unit volume following a particle. We are interested in the rate of this. We define 1 over volume times the material derivative of the volume, dv dt, as the volumetric strain rate. You can see that this matches the definition where volumetric strain rate is the rate of change of volume of a fluid particle per unit volume, and we're following a fluid particle as we discussed when we derived this material derivative. It's the rate of change of volume of a fluid particle following the particle divided by the volume, or per unit volume. I'll give a couple physical examples first. Suppose an initially square fluid particle moves in the flow and distorts such that this area is the same as this area. We're doing this in 2D, but you can easily extend this in your mind to 3D. These have equal volumes, therefore the volumetric strain rate is zero. Consider a different case. This initially square fluid particle moves to a new location where it expands such that the volume is greater. Here the volumetric strain rate is greater than zero since the volume has increased. It turns out that volumetric strain rate in Cartesian coordinates is the sum of the three diagonal components of the strain rate tensor. So we can easily solve for volumetric strain rate for one of our previous example problems and determine whether this flow is compressible or incompressible, where I make this important comment that if volumetric strain rate is zero everywhere, the flow is incompressible. That would be this example. This flow is incompressible since the volume of a fluid particle does not change as it moves, whereas in this case the flow is compressible since the volume changes. In this case, density goes down. So for our simple velocity field, del u del x is 2y, del v del y is minus 2y, and del w del z is 0, which adds up to 0. Since the volumetric strain rate is 0 everywhere, this flow is incompressible. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.